Adversity affects us all in different ways. Some of us can't do anything but push through and keep going. Others have a harder time, and still others, if we're lucky, have someone to pull us through. That's what happened here. Hello everybody, welcome to Aude and Tulva, where we're walking our way through Tolkien's Legendarium. Today we're finishing up book one of The Fellowship of the Ring with chapter 12, Flight to the Fort. Now the first thing I want to point out, kind of as a side note, is that almost this whole chapter is either talking about Frodo or Strider, with a few of the others kind of slipped in. Something I know it's just this time really reading through, and I think it kind of makes sense. I guess we'll see if you do too. The opening of this chapter is grim. Frodo was just stabbed by what others saw as really just a black cloak moving along the ground. Of course, Frodo saw the Witch King in full wraith mode, which is why he suddenly wakes asking about the Pale King. So at this point, you could probably say that Sam, Merry, and Pippin are worried about him, and Sam shows his worry by almost striking out at Strider when he returns. Now, it's a really good thing, duh, that they had Strider with them. Not only is he formidable, but he has a good head on his shoulders. He first made sure they were as safe as possible before taking time to heal Frodo, as Frodo was clearly still alive. That's good triage. Can't really help anyone if you're dead. But instead of snapping at Sam and telling him he's an idiot for drawing a sword, it's a gentle rebuff and immediately he's help, he gives help to Frodo. He even takes Sam aside as like the tears come and he works to bolster him. Don't despair, said Strider. You must trust me now. Your Frodo is made of sterner stuff than I had guessed, though Gandalf hinted that it might prove so. He is not slain, and I think he will resist the evil power of the wound longer than his enemies expect. I will do all that I can to help and heal him. Guard him well while I am away. He hurried off and disappeared again into the darkness, and then even gives Sam an important job of keeping Frodo safe. We then see Strider start to open up a bit and start providing more information to the hobbits about what they're doing, where they're going, that sort of thing. It's something a lot of people do, you know, just one step at a time, keeping the focus at the next landmark, the next goal. If you look too far ahead, you start getting discouraged, and as he tells the hobbits where they're going, it's a really great way for Tolkien to remind us about the map at the beginning of the book and tell us, remind us to flip back so we can know exactly where they are. We can see they're roughly twice as far from Rivendell as they are from Bree, but the way Strider, through Tolkien, tells it, it's a small area inside of a very large world. We have now come to the River Horwell, that the elves call Mithiathel. It flows down out of the Etmores, the Trollfills, north of Rivendell, and joins the Loudwater away in the south. Some call it the Great Flood after that. It is a great water before it finds the sea. There's no way over it below its sources in the Etmores except by the last bridge on which the road crosses. Strider isn't lying, but he's just framing their path in a certain way. I like to think of it as kind of his first sales pitch. And of course, as they travel, Hobbitry rears its head again, but not really in the way you'd normally think. I mean, of course, Pippin is involved, but he aims it at Strider, and it doesn't quite come off the first time. Listen to this first little exchange. Who lives in this land, he asked, and who built these towers? Is this troll country? No, said Strider. Trolls do not build. No one lives in this land. Men once dwelt here ages ago, but none remain now. They became an evil people, as legends tell, for they fell under the shadow of Angmar. But all were destroyed in the war that brought the North Kingdom to its end. But that is now so long ago that the hills have forgotten them though a shadow still lies on the land. Where did you learn such tales, if all the land is empty and forgetful? asked Peregrine. The birds and beasts do not tell tales of that sort. The heirs of Elendil do not forget all things past, said Strider, and many more things that I can tell are remembered in Rivendell. It starts with the simple question and answer, and Pippin gets all pippiny and kind of taunts Strider. Basically he says, what, the animals told you? While Strider's response feels, a little still-tilted and, and kind of stuffy, I can see it as an attempt, at least, at hobbitry. Like, almost overblown haughtiness. If you, like, do you see it? Kind of a, my dad can beat up your dad, except it's my lineage is cooler than your lineage. And while the hobbitry from Strider falls kind of flat, it does something else. The next person to talk is Frodo. The first time Frodo talks since the very first page of this chapter, about five pages prior. While it might feel awkward for him, Strider is starting to relate better to the hobbits and get them comfortable. They're trusting him more, and he's even piquing their curiosity to keep their minds off their troubles. And we can't forget about the best hobbitry from Strider in this whole chapter and possibly the entire book. After they travel for a few more pages, Pippin comes back from scouting ahead. There are trolls, Pippin panted, down in the clearing in the woods, not far below. We got a sight of them through the tree trunks. They are very large. We will come and look at them, said Strider, picking up a stick. Frodo said nothing, but Sam looked scared. Strider walked forward unconcernedly. Get up, old stone, he said, and broke his stick upon the stooping troll. Nothing happened. There was a gasp of astonishment from the hobbits, and then even Frodo laughed. Well, he said, we're forgetting our family history. 
These must be the very three that were caught by Gandalf quarreling over the right way to cook 13 dwarves and one hobbit. When Pippin comes back with the report of trolls, Strider already seems to know what they're going to find. That's why he just picks up a stick. Instead of peeking through the brush and telling Pippin, I think we're okay, he hits the troll with the stick. It's like a little joke, his own style of hobbitry. Even scolds Pippin a paragraph later. You are forgetting not only your family history, but all you ever knew about trolls, said Strider. It is broad daylight with a bright sun, and yet you come back trying to scare me with the tale of live trolls waiting for us in this glade. In any case, you might have noticed that one of them has an old bird's nest behind his ear. That would be a most unusual ornament for a live troll. Yes, it still feels a bit stilted, but he's participating, and it gets the hobbits active and laughing, and their minds are off their troubles. In fact, they're finally so comfortable with the situation that they call for a song. Boy, are you all in for a treat. Make sure you like this video as it is the first time, possibly the last, I have ever been recorded singing. Here's my best impression of Sam. Troll sat alone on his feet of stone and munched and mumbled a bare old bone. For many a year he had not it near, for meat was hard to come by. Done by, gum by, in a cave in the hills he dwelt alone and meat was hard to come by. Lord. <laughs> Up came Tom with his big boots on. He said to the troll, pray what is yon? For it looks like the shit of my uncle Tim as should be lying in a graveyard. Caveyard, paveyard, this many a year has Tim been gone. I thought he were lying in a graveyard. My lad said, troll, this bone I stole. But what be bones that lie in a hole? That uncle was dead as a lump o' lead afore I found his shin bone. Tin bone, thin bone, he can spare a spare for the poor old troll, for he don't need his shin bone. Said Tom, I don't see why the like so thee, without ax and leave, should go making free, with the shank of the shin of my father's kin, so hand the old bone over. Rover, trover, though he be dead, it belongs to he, so hand the old bone over. For a couple of pins, says Toll and grins, I eat thee too and gnaw thy shins. A bit of fresh meat will go down sweet, I'll try my teeth on thee now. He now, see now, I'm tired o' non on bolds and skins, I've a mind to dine on thee now. But just as he thought his dinner was caught, he found his hands had hold of not. Before he could mind, Tom slipped behind and gave him a boot to larn him. Warn him, darn him, a bump o' the boot on the seat Tom thought would be the way to larn him. But harder than stone is the flesh show and bone of a troll that sits in the hills alone. As well set your boot to the mountain's root for the seat of a troll, don't feel it. Peel it, heal it. Old troll laughed when he heard Tom groan and he knew his toes could feel it. Tom's leg is game since home he came and his bootless foot is lasting lame. But troll don't care and he's still there with a the bone he boned from its owner. Donor. Bone or Troll's old seat is still the same and the bone he boned from its owner. Now, I'm, I'm sorry for that, but there you go. My interpretation of Sam's song he made up by himself. At least he probably used the melody and inserted his own words. I won't dive into the poem, but if you want, of course, a great analysis, check out episode 85 of Exploring Lord of the Rings. Corey, as always, does an amazing job. But other than embarrassing myself, why did I bring this song up? How does it relate to Strider getting them through their troubles and danger? Well, he's allowing and participating in the hobbitry. He's not telling them to, to be quiet or anything. He's giving them a release from the stress. It's something you'll see if you watch uh, like Band of Brothers, which at this point is pretty old, but it's a good example. The first time I watched it, I was like at times confused as to why they were joking about some things. Like I think they were in Norway and one of the guys got shot in the butt cheek and he got you know, sideways, four holes, one bullet, and everyone thought it was hilarious. That sort of dark humor really keeps people going and gives them reasons to laugh. Something I'm guessing Tolkien saw a lot of while he was in the trenches in World War I. As Strider continues to drive the hobbits towards safety in Rivendell, they get a bit of a scare, but only a sec for like a second, because Tolkien is a master at what he does. As a rider bears down on a little company, he uses onomatopoeia to tell us whether they should be worried or not. Clippity clippity clip is not the sound a mount of a black riders would make. It's a surprisingly not subtle, but subtle way, something I've never really caught for at least a few reads through. So now they have Glorfindel in their company and that's pretty sweet pickup, like first round draft pick all day. Even Strider, who has been their rock for the last 12 days. But once they meet Glorfindel, they were able to pick up the pace even more. The hobbits began to find it hard to keep up with the swift, tireless feet of the elf. On he led them into the mouth of darkness and still on under the deep clouded night. There was neither star nor moon, not until the gray of dawn did he allow them to halt. Pippin, Merry, and Sam were by that time nearly asleep on their stumbling legs, and even Strider seemed by the sag of his shoulders to be weary. 
At this point, Strider, who was the one pulling everybody else through, humble enough to let Glorfindel take the lead and accept the help of the magical booze from the elf. And now we come to it. They're essentially in sight of the ford of the River Bruinen and safely in Rivendell when the Black Riders show up. And even though Frodo had Strider to drag him here and Glorfindel to give him the last push and put Frodo on the horse, Asphaloth, Frodo, weary from lack of sleep and wound, instead of running, pauses. Ride forward, ride, cried Glorfindel to Frodo. He did not obey at once, for a strange reluctance seized him. Checking the horse to a walk, he turned and looked back. The riders seemed to sit upon their great steeds like threatening statues upon the hill, dark and solid, while all the woods and land about them receded as if into a mist. Suddenly he knew in his heart that they were silently commanding him to wait. Then at once fear and hatred awoke in him. His hand left the bridle and gripped the hilt of his sword, and with a red flash he drew it. Luckily, Asphaloth listens better to Glorfindel than Frodo does, and he bears Frodo away. And again, we, we come to it, the final showdown, the battle of wills, and surprisingly wits. And the wits part is actually kind of funny. Like, you realize the Black Riders might actually have a sense of humor at this point. Though I doubt their hobbitry is really up to snuff. Says Frodo. Go back, he cried. Go back to the land of Mordor and follow me no more. To which they, the Black Riders, reply with laughter and come back. Come back, they called. To Mordor, we will take you. It's not exactly a philological jest by any stretch, but they flip what Frodo says and, you know, they mock him while laughing. So I guess there's still a little bit of human left in them, maybe? And Frodo here, probably not knowing what to do, goes back to the things that have saved him in the past. By Elbereth and Luthien the Fair, said Frodo with the last effort, lifting up his sword. You shall have neither the ring nor me. He falls back on Elbereth, whose name saved him on Weathertop, and then Luthien, whose story held at bay the fear of the Black Riders while they were in the Dell. You can tell it's reflexive because he can hardly even tell them to go back. He just whispers it. I can almost see this as a nod to, to Tolkien's Catholicism. It brings to mind this. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And I think it almost worked. I mean, not really like worked per se, but definitely caused them to pause. You see it here. Then the leader, who was now half across the ford, stood up menacing in his stirrups and raised up his hand. Frodo was stricken dumb. He felt his tongue cleave to his mouth and his heart laboring. His sword broke and fell out of his shaking hand. The leader knew those words could hurt or at least affect them. He did what he needed to do and shut Frodo up. But not only does it force the Witch King into action, it wastes time. Waste time for what, you may ask? Well, you probably didn't. You probably read the book, but still, here we go. At that moment, there came a roaring and a rushing, a noise of loud waters rolling many stones. Dimly, Frodo saw the river below him rise, and down along its course, there came a plumed cavalry of waves. White flames seemed to Frodo to flicker on their crests, and he half fancied that he saw amid the waters white riders upon the white horses with frothing manes. The three riders that were still in the midst of the ford were overwhelmed. They disappeared, buried suddenly under angry foam. Those that were behind drew back in dismay. With his last failing senses, Frodo heard cries, and it seemed to him that he saw, beyond the riders that hesitated on the shore, a shining figure of white light and behind it ran small, shadowy forms waving flames that flared red in the gray mist that was falling over the world. Frodo's friends, the people he relied on, the people who pushed him and pulled him out of danger and towards safety, they show up. Glorfindel does this amazing, like super powerful thing, and everybody else brings fire. <laughs> they push, figuratively, the Black Riders into the flood of Bruinen. And for a second time, Frodo blacks out. Now I know the whole premise of this chapter and video of friends pushing and pulling you through adversity could be talked about in just about every chapter of the book, especially when you get to the last chapters in Mordor. While even though deep in Mordor, Frodo is at his most spiritually beaten down, in this chapter, he can't even walk. He's almost a wraith, as we'll find out in the next chapter. I would say that he was never this close to becoming a wraith in any other part of the book. And isn't it kind of an overarching theme people talk about anyway, friendship? I like it. And you see why I think it makes sense that this chapter mostly talks about Frodo and Strider? Let me know in the comments. We're, we're being pushed to get to know two of the main characters more and more. Their love for each other is growing and we're seeing the friendship start with the trust that only someone whose life literally rested in your hand can really bring. Man, I love this book. And that's all I have for today. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, out into the day shall come again.